Pulse oximetry. It is pulsating and oximetry nating. Pulse photoplethysmography. Oh, Jesus Christ. Can you pronounce that last word? No, I can say plethysmograph, but I can't say <laughs> pleth. I can't do it. I, I can't actually make my mouth form the words. Plethysmogra- plethysmography? It, does, it doesn't sound right. I wasn't hooked on phonics. I don't have someone here to break it down for me. Something interesting. That, that I, I have to put this out there. When I was researching for this podcast, I came across a Wikipedia page on pulse oximetry. Say what you will about Wikipedia. I find it useful sometimes. It's useful for the references. It is. And speaking of references, I was going down the page to see who the author was. And I had to go through a few like menus to figure this out. But it was a bot. A bot? Like artificial intelligence. Oh, man. Wikipedia is sentient. Sen- sentient. So it kind of scared me. And it was very well written. I thought. It, Good bot. It, it was. It was written better <laughs> than any human could do. And I, I, I was like, Elon Musk would be proud. That's that's our overlords right there. <laughs> They're coming for us. They are. Humans are stupid and kill the planet. And we're just going to teach you about medicine and teach ourselves. That's, that's what Wikipedia is for. It's so that bots can share information like that and learn from each other. That's a scary thought. <laughs> Machine learning. Ooh. Mark my words, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So, pulse oximetry is basic, but we still mess it up. It's not that easy. It's not as easy as uh, people make it out to be. And we don't spend a lot of time talking about it because we spend more time teaching people how to immobilize a patient that does no good. Are you saying that we shouldn't be doing standing takedowns on every wreck? <laughs> so what is this hearsay? I'm saying we our time would be better if we allotted more time to pulse oximetry and understanding it and helping that inform our clinical decision making when treating a patient. Is pulse oximetry a vital sign? Yes. I know some references don't call it a vital sign. Is it the fifth vital sign or the sixth or the seventh? I've lost track of what number vital sign that we're supposed to be taking on every single patient now. One thing about pulse oximetry is it's not as sexy as entitled CO2 or waveform capnography. Uh, so I think that that's kind of why we don't talk about it. And it's been out for a while. I can tell you this, that it's pulse oximetry is not usually on any type of uh, in-service or orientation program for uh, paramedics or EMTs coming out of school. But I think that it probably should. Um, we, we've talked about entitled CO2, but I want to reiterate that they are two different physiological parameters. I've heard some paramedics say, well, now that I have entitled CO2, I don't need SpO2. Why is that thought process flawed? That's flawed on many levels, but mainly because entitled CO2 tells you precisely nothing about a patient's oxygenation. All entitled CO2 tells you at its fundamental level, it's the same thing with the PaO2. It only tells you that alveolar gas exchange is occurring. We infer a lot of things based off that. But at the end of the day, all it says is there's gas exchange happening here. So basically, a patient can be completely apneic have no air movement uh, except for oxygen that can passively diffuse down into the alveoli and they can maintain an adequate SpO2 for some time. Uh, all the while their entitled CO2 is uh, climbing through the roof. Didn't you, weren't you, uh, didn't you recently attend some military training where they uh, lowered the actual oxygen content? Oh yeah. Um, the Rob D trainer. So I recently went to the uh, U.S. Army School for Aviation Medicine, and one of the things that we did there was the Rob D trainer, which is like a high altitude simulator. And I'm going to screw up the specifics here, but just bear with me. So basically, what they did was they hooked me up in this uh, like fighter jet pilot mask kind of contraption that made me feel real cool for all of about 15 minutes. <laughs> 
and they hooked us up to an old school anesthesia machine. And basically what it did was it just <clears throat> good going computer. But basically what the Rob D does is it just displaces the uh, amount of inspired oxygen with nitrogen. So they turn up the amount of nitrogen that's being delivered to you through you to the mask and that thereby decreases the amount of FiO2 that you're receiving. So basically what they did was they simulated an altitude of about a thousand of about 18,000 feet. And this was awesome because you basically got to get drunk on the company dime without ever touching <laughs> alcohol. But it was a, it was a, kind of a demonstration to show you the effects of hypoxia and that gave you this this two-sided sheet and it had all sorts of little quizzes and things like that that you had to try and work your way through and throughout the entire evolution you could actually look at the pulse oximeter on the machine and see how long you stayed at a particular reading do you know how far down you went i got down to about 60 I actually felt okay. And that's one of the dangers of hypoxia that you learn about when you, when you do the, the aviation med. But what surprised me more was how long knowing that we basically went straight up to 18,000 feet of simulated altitude of how long that pulse oximeter actually stayed in an acceptable range. Like what most people would consider acceptable, you know, between 90 and a hundred. So I started out on room air at about 99% and then, Six or seven minutes in, I was still in the 90 percentile. And then we dropped off real quick, which is probably a function of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. But we're not going to get into that right now, (laughs) are we? That's pretty impressive. And that's not necessarily because I've spent any time at altitude that I was able to still be a functioning human being. But more the fact that I'm a young military aged male that's in decent health. (laughs) So I have a decent amount of oxygen reserve built in, but young people can also tolerate hypoxia. At least young people in my age range can tolerate hypoxia a lot better I than think, most of the patients we deal with. I think it's interesting because they were giving you nitrogen. And if if they completely devoided the air of both uh, oxygen and nitrogen, then I suppose your alveoli would uh, collapse. You'd get out of lactosis, but the nitrogen kind of acted as a pillow or a cushion to keep those alveoli open so that you didn't die because you would probably rapidly desaturate if that happened. Yeah, if you became you know structurally like deficient or atelectatic, you would probably de- you know desaturate quicker. But I mean it was basically delivered sort of under positive pressure, not like CPAP or anything like that, but you you could definitely feel that you were but basically, you're you're in a mask, and you could feel the flow of air. Yeah, like it. You you didn't. You got air hunger, but you didn't get air hunger from a lack of gas flow. You got air hunger from the effect of hypoxia. It was really cool because every like you you know you you get sent this list of 18 different symptoms or whatever it is of hypoxia, and then one of the things you do in the exercise is actually check off which ones that you're feeling, mm-hmm. and supposedly the way it's supposed to work, me being me, didn't follow directions. You check off three and then you tap out because that's considered a danger. Well, I, you kept going. it's a controlled environment, so why not just see how far we can go, right? <laughs> this is, they actually expressly told us this is not a competition at the beginning, but I kind of wanted to see how long I could last on the thing. I think that the most interesting thing about this simulator is that I, I'm sure that you looked pretty well other than the effects of hypoxia that you were feeling i think that if somebody looked at you and then looked at your spo2 your oxygen saturation they would probably think that that oxygen saturation had to be incorrect because i'm sure that you looked pretty well i doubt that you know you were cyanotic to any degree and i think that we see that a lot in our field if the actual number doesn't match um, the assessment of the patient, then they dismiss it as an inherently incorrect number. And I think that we see this a lot. There's Probably. a particular name for this type of bias, and it escapes me right now. Confirmation bias. As I say, I was thinking it was confirmation bias, but it sounded a little too good to be true, a little too straightforward. <sighs> yeah, that's true of a lot of things in our clinical practice, right? Like. We look, we look for everything to confirm our preconceived notion. And then if it doesn't, we just kind of dismiss it as an abnormality or an anomaly or something else that can be easily explained away versus 
an actual pathological change. I think if you understand uh, pulse oximetry, just like with any other piece of equipment, then you know when you can trust it, when you can't. Generally, in terms of pulse oximetry, if you have a good pleth, uh, you should probably trust that. I think the pulse oximetry, at least the number, is accurate up to about, what is it, 70 or 80 percent? After that, most of the cutoffs that I have read is that they they guarantee four percent margin of error between ninety and a hundred, and then that margin grows when you get to about the eightieth percentile, and then anything less than fifty is so unpredictable that you just it's completely discounted. That's why if you look at most SBO two monitors, like on the LifePack fifteen that yeah. I use, if you have a profoundly hypoxic patient that actually has an SBO two below fifty percent or is at that threshold, it just displays a less than sign and then fifty percent. It doesn't give you a reading. Yeah, I think that's kind of clinically relevant though, because if it's less than eighty five percent, the patient's sick and you're probably going to be treating them pretty aggressively. Yeah, that's typically one of those findings that you you discover when yeah. you you've got that COPD or that waited four weeks to call in the living room that's basically obtunded and. You're like, oh, they're purple. And you put it on and you see, oh, oh, God. Well, I was kind of inspired by this after we interviewed uh, Dr. Jeff Jarvis about their DS- DSI protocol. And they, when they're performing delayed sequence intubation, if that pulse ox comes off the finger, then they stop the procedure. Yeah, because they recognize the utility of the tool. Yeah, because if you're proceeding with an intubation and you don't know what the SPO2 is, then that patient could rapidly desaturate and you wouldn't have any way of knowing. So the safer thing is to abort the procedure and oxygenate the patient. Yeah. And you know what won't tell you anything about a rapid desaturation? Entitled CO2. Entitled CO2. (laughs) Yep. So did we say that uh, entitled and SPO2 are two different uh, monitoring parameters? They are. Right, they so are two totally different things. One does not supplant the other. They work in conjunction to form a differential diagnosis and confirm your treatments. Yada, 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 something straight from the e- NREMT. So SPO2 is important, and I always make sure to switch one of my monitoring leads to view the SPO2 pleth whenever I'm measuring a patient's oxygen saturation. So one might think that if a patient is hypotensive, then they can't uh, rely on the pulse oximeter values. However, a patient can be hypotensive and still have good pulsatile blood flow to the fingertip or wherever you're measuring SpO2 from. If they're severely clamped down um, and you and you can't get a good pleth or a good SpO2 waveform then your SpO2 reading could be erroneous. But a patient who is hypotensive but is vasodilated could still have good pulsatile blood flow to that fingertip. And we see a vasodilatory shock in the vast majority of our shock cases. Or just, and we run into this all the time, patients with chronic untreated hypertension or peripheral vascular disease or any number of arterial disease. Yeah. Any number of like vascular um, pathologies or just cardiovascular disease in general will affect that reading. Ron, now there have been other proposed uses for pulse ox symmetry, specifically for using the pulse ox plus for reasons other than just for determining oxygen saturation. These other uses hinge off of the principle that the pleth is similar to an arterial waveform and that there are changes in the volume status or when there are changes in the volume status and or the patient's respiratory mechanics, you'll get variations in the pulse oximetry waveform uh, when fluid is given or when volume is removed. Some of these studies will list in the show notes describe these changes. However, they all have multiple limitations, uh, such as they're con- they're conducted under strict control, such as mechanical ventilation, or they're in post-operative patients, um, and different devices use use different filters 
And on most Pulse Ox waveforms, there are no scales on the screen, so the determination is actually pretty subjective. Is that extrapolatable to the pre-hospital field? I don't know, but I think if if some of these device manufacturers want to reach out and let us do a trial, I'd be happy to do that. Now, Massimo has a device that measures what they call the pleth variability index. Um, I think that this is probably the future, but it's not something I really want to be an early adopter on unless we have more uh, data showing its applicability in the pre-hospital field. Is that extrapolatable in a non um, in a patient who's not on a mechanical ventilator? I don't know. If if I see a patient who has severe COPD or asthma and they're not moving much air, and I see variability in that pleth, then that might help me confirm that they have uh, some type of uh, obstructive disease pathology, but. I'm probably already keying in on that to begin with. Yeah, it doesn't really, I I don't necessarily think that that particularly adds anything to the clinical assessment because ostensibly in this patient, you're also going to have them on end title. Right. And you'll be able to see either, you know, signs of air trapping or bronchospastic changes on the, on the waveform. It's cool. It's a little bit of minutia, but when it gets into basically the pleth wave, Variability. Yeah. There's there's other monitoring devices that do that a lot better, like the Pico catheter or any other number of invasive lines. But they're invasive and so on. Not necessarily applicable to us. But the thing that I would like to to purvey is that the pulse ox pleth is a thing. Uh, it does have a purpose other than to occupy space on the bottom of the life pack and keep you mildly entertained during long transfers. Its presence or absence can be indicative of things. The like. characteristic can be indicative of things, and these things I will let Floyd articulate because he's smarter. But one thing I like to use the the presence or absence of is: Does this patient have a pulse? Number one, mm-hmm. that's usually if you if and we've all been in that situation where you're looking at your partner across the bed and you're like, "Does this guy have a pulse or not?" Don't act like you've never been there. But that can that can be one. But also for tourniquet placement, and I don't think a lot of providers necessarily know about how useful just the fact that a patient has a pleth is. So recently had a transfer, and there was a uh, commercial tourniquet applied because this this gentleman has sustained a uh, ext- you know pretty significant vascular injury to one of his extremities, and put the pleth on or the uh, SPO two probe on rather, and notice he had a little bit of a rolling pleth. It was super low amplitude. But it was there. And if you go back to our massive hemorrhage podcast, which is shamelessly self-promote, you know that the goal of a tourniquet is to completely extinguish the distal pulse. All arterial flow needs to be mitigated. So that pleth indicated to me that we had blood flow to the distal extremity, and we need to extinguish that. Tighten down the tourniquet just a little bit. Guess what went away? The pleth. The pleth. Mm-hmm. So now we have a way to to gauge whether or not we have an effective tourniquet. You know, the wound wasn't bleeding. It was hemostatic. It was doing its job. But we kind of, in effect, had a venous tourniquet. And that, that you know, infers complication later on down the line, puts them at risk for compartment syndrome, and so on and so forth. So that's always one good thing to check. That's a trauma utility. Another utility is, I know you've paced patients, and I've paced patients, and the AHA says, yo, check for a pulse to make sure you have electromechanical capture. But if you've ever tried to feel a pulse on a patient that's being paced yeah. at an energy where you actually have electrical capture, it's kind of difficult because they are jerking all over the place. Yeah, I had a pretty interesting case of a patient who was going in and out of cardiac arrest. She was a transfer and uh, she would go into cardiac arrest. You would uh, perform CPR for a minute or so and then you get a pulse back after CPR and a round of epi. And... um she started braiding down on us for like the third or fourth time. And I thought, why not just try to pace her just to see if I get captured? I knew she was extremely acidotic. Um, and I, um, con- I subconsciously thought that I would not get um, mechanical capture because of how sick she was. And surprisingly, even though her blood pressure was 
borderline peri-arrest the whole time, uh, and she was maxed out on both uh, norepi and epi, we still had a good pleth in that patient. So she started to Brady down again, and I ended up turning the milliamps to 200 uh, because I was leaving. Nothing. That's a lot of juice. I was leaving nothing to chance, right? Because it was that or we start CPR again. Um, then I see what I what I thought was electrical capture. And I saw this little tiny blip on the pulse ox. And this little tiny blip corresponded to the pace beats. And again, going back to confirmation bias, if that's the actual right bias that we're supposed to be calling it. Um, I I did not have any other signs of mechanical capture besides those little blips. And I couldn't convince myself that I had capture. So I turned it off. We started CPR and we did the whole thing over again. Uh, the patient um, obviously ended up not surviving. Um, but I sent that strip to a person who I consider an expert in transcutaneous pacing and uh, the difference between false and true capture, who sees a lot of cases like this. And he's like, yeah, Floyd, you probably did. You probably had capture. Uh, but I talked myself right out of it. Um, that, so and- you would say that an effective way of confirming capture is... Using the pleth, using using the pleth, because um, all of all of the other methods uh, that are really subjective will fail you. I think we've talked about palpating a pulse on the show before. Uh, if if you have a patient on ECMO um, and you have a group of people come up to feel the pulse and say whether or not they felt a pulse, about half of them will say they did, and half would say they didn't. So going back to what Ryan was saying about uh, determining if you have a distal pulse in a patient who you place a tourniquet on, you can also use that uh, for lower extremity or even upper extremity fractures. Uh, If you mobilize that extremity, I like to just throw the uh, pulse ox probe on, uh, on whatever extremity is fractured or immobilized. And then I have a continuous monitoring of that pulse and I think that using the pulse ox waveform is good for those black or white situations. You got it or you don't. And I'm not sure that we can extrapolate a whole lot of other information out of that right now with our current technology. And the technology keeps getting better and better. Not with our technology. And I'm, I'm sure someone's going to pull up one of the, the variability studies and stuff like that. But let's be real honest. Are we going to really be paying attention to plethysmograph amplitude variability that's not glaringly obvious in the back of the truck? Probably yeah. not. Yeah, and that's the issue with all of this is, um, one, because your your distal circulation in your fingers, uh, they're more susceptible to endogenous catecholamines, so they can shut down and open up. Your more centrally located vessels, like the ones in your in your forehead, your nose, your ear, those are probably more accurate, and they're they're less uh, permeable to changes in uh, in tone. They stay relatively stable. So I think if they develop something for that purpose, it's probably going to have to um, be uh, something that can measure it more centrally because if they if they developed it like fingertip uh, type devices then they they'd have to somehow uh, account for the changes in vessel tone um, which is difficult to do yeah and another problem is that there's a lack of scales on the screen so you may get some variability let's say you're looking to see if the patient responds to a fluid bolus you look for uh, changes in the variability in the pulse ox amplitude or uh, or just in variability. Um, the problem is that is with that is that you don't really have any scales. You can't measure that. So it's entirely subjective. Yeah, like with a Pico cath or with a you know, more commonly an A-line, you, your scale is the is the blood pressure reading. And you can't it's a lot harder to extrapolate that from a uh, distal extremity pulse oximeter. Because you're not really 
you're getting an arterial waveform, but you're not getting it that's so quantifiable that you can you can throw an, an X and a Y axis on it. Then at least that's my take. Yeah, and you know, one of the studies that we looked at, uh, Ryan said that you need greater than a 50 per, 15% change in vari- variation to determine if the patient is fluid responsive. And this is um, only if the patient is mechanically ventilated. So if you don't have an algorithm that actually determines that for you, I think that it's of limited clinical utility. So pulse oximetry is a useful tool. And I I think I've seen someone on Twitter say that it should be the first uh, monitoring device that goes on the patient because of all the information that it gives you. If you get a SpO2 and a good pleth, then you know that the patient has a perfusing pulse. It also tells you the uh, oxygenation status of the patient. And going back to black or white uses of the pulse ox waveform, I heard a lecture from a from an EMS medical director of a large EMS service. They had a case where a EMS crew responded in the middle of the night on a patient in cardiac arrest. And their protocol allowed them to terminate resuscitation for patients in asystole or PEA. They met the protocol requirements for terminating the patient, and the patient was in PEA. They called med control. They got uh, orders to terminate. During a re- retrospective review of that case, they noticed that when they terminated the patient, the pulse ox probe was on the finger, and they had a good uh, pulse ox pleth. Um, so that patient clearly had a heart that was beating, and a heart that was uh, not just beating, but was perfusing the distal extremity. And they terminated that patient. Um, after that, they implemented uh, protocols and standards that required the use of pulse oximetry on the fingertip of every patient in cardiac arrest, and they trained all their first responders um, on that. Surprisingly, they did not fault that paramedic because they 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 determined that it was a system failure because that was not implemented previously. And when they pulled that paramedic in to review the case. He saw the pulse ox uh, waveform when he was just looking at uh, at the chart and realized what had happened before anybody um, before anybody had to bring it up to him, and it's a devastating case. Um, surprisingly, they did not the the paramedic did not get in trouble. It was not punitive, and I just want to say that that's the that's the type of medical director that I would want to work under. Okay, let's get back to pulse oximetry. But there are some pitfalls of pulse oximetry. I will let uh, Ryan elaborate on that, but there are times when you can have an an inaccurate pulse ox value or SpO2, uh, even with a good pleth. So one of the biggest ones that most people know of is uh, dyshemoglobinemias. And this is a fancy word for stuff that looks like oxygen-bound hemoglobin, but isn't. Because remember, the the conventional pulse ox that we use on most ambulances doesn't differentiate between different types of hemoglobin. So there's, I can't remember exactly how many species of hemoglobin there are, but there's a ton. Yeah, so it doesn't necessarily differentiate between different types. It measures the saturation of bound hemoglobin and whatever species of hemoglobin that is at its most basic level. So the ones that we use, that I use at work, I don't even have a CO monitor on. It is literally just telling me how much bound hemoglobin is present by its analysis. So the most common pitfall, or the one that we're taught about the most, is carbon monoxide poisoning. In the classic patient that is carbon monoxide toxic, but has a normoxic or even hyperoxic uh, SpO2 reading. So you can have someone who's profoundly hypoxic at a cellular level from carbon monoxide poisoning, but they've got a perfect saturation. And that's because the pulse oximeter is falsely identifying bound carboxyhemoglobin. Yeah, this is something that that everyone talks about uh, in your EMT or paramedic class. 
everyone brings this up as one thing to watch out for. And I do think that it is important. If you have reason to suspect uh, carbon monoxide poison or for whatever reason met hemoglobinemia, um, then then you should still provide oxygen to that patient. Now, there are newer generation pulse oxes out there. So your traditional pulse oximeters, they measure or they emit uh, red and infra- infrared light, and um, that light is absorbed differently by oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. That's where we get our SpO2 uh, percentage from. There are newer generation pulse oxes that look at different seven plus wavelengths of light and measure these different species of hemoglobin saturation. But everything I've read, not, not only are these things expensive, right? And it may be hard for a lot of EMS services uh, to purchase these uh, CO oximeters, um, but I've heard that they are largely inaccurate. The accuracy varies, um, and some studies say that it's around 50%, and they do not recommend that it supplant laboratory studies. Some smokers may have elevated CO levels at baseline, but either way, elevated levels, they can broaden your differential, um, but they shouldn't be used to direct patient management. The other one is methemoglobin. So you can get methemoglobinemia from a number of causes. But methemoglobinemia is is one of the, the dyshemoglobinemias that can cause a falsely elevated uh, SpO2 reading or can be a useful, if, you're, uh, if your monitor can quantify it, a useful measure in its own right. So the classic presentation is a teething child that presents in respiratory distress or is profoundly cyanotic and you can't necessarily pinpoint why. And if you have, if you're lucky enough to have a device that can read methemoglobin levels, you see that their methemoglobin level is is uh, profoundly elevated, and it's typically caused by local anesthetics. So, like um, applied uh, varieties of lidocaine or novocaine, like to the gum, can cause methemoglobinemia, and that's that's a recognized uh, phenomenon with a lot of uh, anesthetic agents. Also recognized phenomenon with nitrate therapy, sulfonamides, uh, methylene blue, and a bunch of other stuff. What about sulfonylurea? Sulfonylureas will do it too. Silver nitrate will do it too <laughs> if you're still if you're around a. I don't know when we would run into that because that's not necessarily standard of care in burn therapy anymore either. But silver nitrate will cause methemoglobinemia, and there's some congenital methemoglobinemias as well. So I think another pitfall that we've pretty much already talked about is that SPL2 cannot... Benzocaine, de- that's it. Benzocaine. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Another pitfall that we've kind of already talked about is that SPL2 will not detect hypoventilation, especially if your patient is already on oxygen. A patient on oxygen can become apneic and maintain an SP- a good SPL2 pleth, um, assuming that they have good perfusion and don't have atelectasis, can maintain a good uh, SpO2 saturation for quite some time. However, if a patient is not on oxygen and they start hypoventilating, then they can rapidly uh, desaturate, or you can pick up on that sooner. We see that a lot in our overdose patients. We get on them and uh, they're predipnic. They're breathing a few times a minute. And their SpO2 is uh, significantly low. But just remember that patients on supplemental auction who are hypoventilating can still have normal SpO2. That's yeah, why we that's use the entire, internal. That's the entire premise behind things like apneic oxygenation, right? That's, that's, a, that's a known thing at this point. And it's been, it's been well studied in emergency medicine now, but it, previously that came out of anesthesia literature. And uh, I think another thing that we should probably mention is pulse ox lag time. Pulse ox lag is a big thing. So in in low flow states or in states of shock, pulse ox. Okay, let me let me back up. Pulse ox lag is an inherent part of the monitoring device. Mm-hmm. You're all that is that is a known quantity or a known entity rather. You're always going to have a lag between 
physiological changes either in vascular tone or delivered volume and or oxygen content as measured by the SpO2 probe. You're always going to have a little bit of time between when those changes actually occur within the body and when your device picks them up. Yeah, it, it takes is, a while for what's happening in the heart to get to the fingertip. Yeah, and that's, that's a byproduct of A, our current state of technology, the feasibility to employ it in the back of an ambulance, and a lot of physiology. The, the further you progress in a shock state or in a low flow state or in any number of states that are going to alter that device's ability to be accurate, the greater that lag time is going to increase probably. I say probably because there's always going to be one or two situations where someone can raise an example and be like, Ryan's a dumbass. He's wrong (laughs) in this one situation. But shock states are a big one. If you've ever performed RSI on a patient or been part of a recess where uh, somebody else was performing RSI, you probably have the experience of um, the patient being paralyzed, rapidly desaturating, uh, the patient being successfully intubated. And then it takes a while for that SPO2 to swing the other way. So SPO2 is kind of a time machine. Uh, It can look um, 60 seconds um, up to maybe two minutes in the past, uh, a minute to a minute and a half in the past. I see this going the other direction sometimes when I put, when I'm doing an inner facility transfer of patients that are on CPAP. So... The hospital that we take patients out of the most uses BiPAP mm-hmm. with an adjustable FiO2. Our CPAP circuits at work only deliver a set amount of FiO2. That's 30%. So sometimes I'll notice, or have st- definitely since this phenomenon has been noted more often, what the FiO2 is set on the hospital BiPAP. Because there's been more than one occasion where I've put a patient that was doing very well in terms of their oxygenation status on the hospital BiPAP, put them on my CPAP, and then about five minutes later, notice that they're starting to desaturate. And it's because of that pulse ox lag and the fact that I'm delivering, in a lot of cases, about half the amount of FiO2 that was formerly being delivered while they were on the hospital's BiPAP. And the easy way around this that, that we've kind of figured out is to just place a nasal cannula on under the CPAP mask and deliver... FiO2 that way. So they're getting their pressure and they're getting their oxygen delivery in tandem. It's not the most elegant solution, but it definitely works. Yeah. And just going back to what we were saying about things that are happening uh, in the heart, taking a long time to get to the fingertip. You see this a lot when you're pacing someone. Um, You can successfully have mechanical capture. So as soon as as soon as you successful, as soon as you see a pace beat, the uh, corresponding SPO2 pleth won't always fall uh, immediately below or in tandem with uh, the pace beat. It's it always may, a little bit to the right. It may be pushed out a little bit to the right, depending on the patient's perfusion status. And I've I've seen that before in patients that I that are either being paced at the hospital or I've initiated pacing on in the field. Yeah, it's a, it can be very hard to measure um, sometimes. Sometimes it's very subtle. It can also be difficult to, depending on the patient's body habitus and how much energy you're using, it can also be difficult to keep that pulse ox probe on the finger. Speaking of keeping the pulse ox probe on the finger, um, one thing that we didn't, that we haven't covered is that there are some other things that can influence the accuracy of your pulse ox and not necessarily just the accuracy, but the ability to get a good uh, measurement. So yeah, the accuracy, (laughs) Um, which is um, artifact, movement artifact. So if you have a patient who's having a seizure, um, that movement, or if they have Parkinson's, that movement in their extremities can kind of shift blood around. It it can cause a lot of variability and uh, give you a very poor uh, pulse ox pleth. And that's, I see that a lot. You see that on a, a lot on a helicopter, more so on a helicopter than on an ambulance. Uh, we had a patient where we had a lot of artifact on the helicopter and we switched from the um, reusable 
PulseOx probe to a uh, to a sticky PulseOx probe, and it really didn't change because the vibrations were still happening in that limb. So you had some changes in uh, in blood flow to that extremity. Uh, so that's something to watch out for. I don't think it's I don't know if it's as much as a concern as it was with older models, but the intensity of ambient light yeah. needs to be a big concern as well as the presence of and this is more concerned with neonates, but the presence of uh, infrared heating mm-hmm. apparatus and those wavelengths of light because it starts to get into the wavelengths that the pulse ox is picking up. And it's neat. You can simulate this on yourself. You can go and uh, tape a pulse ox probe securely on your finger and shake your hand even just a little bit, and you will see a lot of variability and uh, get a very poor uh, pleth. Something, the last thing that I kind of want to talk about is a common myth, and that is that if uh, the patient has fingernail pull, fingernail polish on, that you'll get an inaccurate reading. And I think that has been debunked in more than one paper. Now, obviously, if they take like black paint and cake it on, I would imagine that that would affect affect the accuracy of the pulse ox. But a light is still able to pass through that uh, fingernail polish just like it can tissue. I've seen it more... With a uh, finger polish that has like glitter, okay, and stuff in it, uh, you know, just a substance in it that would reflect or otherwise like def- like diffract that light. I could see that. You know what? We should actually do an experiment and get some glitter polish. Are we gonna? We're gonna paint our fingers. I'll do it. I don't care. I'll do it. I'm down. <laughs> That'd be a pretty cool experience. Experiment. That would be. Let's do it. All right. Sounds good. We're uh, gonna paint our fingernails for science. Maybe we'll uh, make a video. Yeah, I'm down. That way they can see my ugly face. Yeah, so stand by for that. We can also do the, uh, well, I think everyone's seen the tourniquet one. It's pretty cool to see. Yeah, we can do the tourniquet Tighten a tourniquet and just watch that pleth go away eventually. Sounds good to me. All right. You have anything else to add? Other than, for the love of God, the pulse ox and the end tidal CO2 are two totally different variables. Yeah, go listen to our end tidal podcast. And, And just... Understand that the pulse ox is measuring a surrogate for oxygenation and there are pitfalls associated with it. You know, we're not necessarily measuring oxygen because we don't have a central catheter that is actually delineating the amount of oxygen in circulation. We're yes, measuring it, the amount of bound hemoglobin. It's not measuring oxygen deliver to the delivery to the tissues. And I think that's a really important point to bring up. And we have to stress that just just because the patient's hemoglobin is fully saturated doesn't mean that oxygen is actually being delivered to the tissues. And that goes back to things like... Yeah. So, I just wanted to bring up this real quick. Um, if you haven't read the ventilator book or the advanced ventilator book, uh, even if you don't have... Uh, and it's literally called the ventilator book. It's by Dr. William Owens. Yeah, even if you don't have a trans, even if you don't have like a sophisticated transport uh, ventilator, I think that it would prove useful to anybody. Um, and I'm going to quote him right now because this is very uh, elegantly stated. He says that the cardiac output has the greatest influence on oxygen delivery, even during pe- during periods of arterial hypoxemia, an increase in cardiac output can be sufficient to deliver the necessary amount of oxygen to the tissues. And then he has a table below and that table show that the effects that an increase in cardiac output can have on oxygen delivery, even with significant anemia or hypoxia. So here's a a few of the elements from the table. If you have a cardiac output of three liters per minute, with uh, hemoglobin saturation of 100%. Because your cardiac output is just 3 liters per minute, your total uh, DO2 is 603 mL. DO2 is your delivery of the oxygen to the actual tissues. Yeah. Just so someone, just so everyone's clear. Your your total uh, delivery is 603 mL of O2 per minute. If you're, if you increase that cardiac output to, 8 liters per minute, 
and your SAO2 is 75%, so 25% lower uh, than the one with three liter with a cardiac output of three liters per minute, uh, then your DO2 would be 1206, 1206 mLs of O2 per minute. So you're essentially doubling. Yeah, you're doubling it, and you're, you're also more than doubling your cardiac output. Um, so I just thought that was a pretty uh, neat uh, fact uh, for people to understand that. And I'm quoting him again an increase in cardiac output can offset hypoxemia. Absolutely. We just wanted to see Ron off before he goes on military leave. We'll come back to you in a month when he gets back with another podcast. Whee! All right. Let us know if you have any questions. Uh, Hopefully by now you know how to get a hold of us at Curb to Bed on our social media platforms. Our email is curbtobed at gmail.com. Bye.